This episode of Meet Me for Coffee is brought to you by Coffee Cola. On a hot day like today, I look for other alternatives, and you know how much I love coffee. This is a refreshing drink infused with caffeine, the, the aroma of, of coffee, and it tastes fantastic. You can check them out at coffeecolacanada.com. And I organize all my business meetings and my family meetings and community meetings through an app called Chatter365. You can check them all out. Download the app at the Apple App Store and the Android Play Store as well, chatter365.com. Right now, Sue Wong is meeting me for coffee on this episode. And I'm really excited because Sue Wong is one of the most iconic uh, fashion designers that I've ever talked to. And going through all her 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 career and listening to her speak, it's become uh, very inspiring. And uh, she has a lot of great messages to tell you. And uh, she can share her success with you as well. Sue Wong, thanks for coming to the show and uh, speaking with me. Yes. Thank you, George, for having me on your show. It's a great honor. And uh, I'm here to really talk about a little bit about my personal history, my career history, my personal philosophy. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I feel that I'm really one of those very, very fortunate human beings to have really lived a sort of very larger than um, uh, sort of epic life, if you will. Um, I was born um, in a, a rural countryside in uh, mainland China, uh, right into the Maoist revolution. And, uh, you know, that was about at least three lifetimes ago. And, uh, you know, it was really when Mao was just really taking over. So um, my movie is called Red Lotus. You know, I'm making a bio a pick of myself. Uh, we're just really sort of polishing the screenplay right now. But it just really sort of juxtaposed, um, uh, ju juxtaposes my childhood growing up in mainland China with, uh, you know, growing up in America and coming of age. And then I was really part of the whole Venice Beach a bohemian culture, a counterculture, you know, uh, it was, you know, I've lived a very artistic lifestyle and, uh, you know, all my ups and downs, uh, you know, of uh, basically over the decades, but through it all, I've really sort of maintained my vision because I'm a very driven human being. And I think part, part of that drive uh, was a result of really being rejected by my father, who was a very old fashioned Chinese man. So basically, in that culture, in the old days, basically, if you were a uh, female, if you were not born the first, you know, born son, uh, you know, which I wasn't, I was really the first born, but I was a daughter, uh, that was a huge disappointment to him. So he sort of rejected my birth and uh, he begrudgingly, you know, brought me over here with my uh, mother. So don't forget, this was really, you know, like in the mid 50s and uh, I was uh, just really a young child and my mother took a great leap of faith um, and she sewed into a little small pillow all of her uh, wedding uh, jewelry and she traded that to the border guard who released us to our freedom uh, into British Hong Kong where we were met on the other side by our relatives who brought us to safety. So, um, and then we waited another um, little over a year and it was a really miracle that my father was able to petition for us to come to this country. So within about a little over a year, we uh, had permission to, to come here. And don't forget, this was really in the 50s at the height of the McCarthy, you know, uh, witch hunt era. So it really was a miracle. And I met my father for the first time. And, you know, here in my child's mind in China, I thought, you know, America was the promised land. And as a matter of fact, the old fashioned Chinese name assigned to America back in those days was called Kim Shan, which means gold mountain. So the Gold Mountain name was really left over from the Gold Rush era uh, in, in the uh, you know mid um, 1850s or so. Uh, generations, the first generation of uh, Chinese would come to America as part of the whole uh, Gold Rush era. And actually, I'm really proud to really say that my Chinese lineage, you know, goes way back to my great-great-grandfather who came over in that era 
and he helped build the railroads, you know, that really uh, near Sacramento that connected the East Coast to the West Coast. And that was really, you know, the beginning of just really making America, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, great power. So I would say my ancestors really have a lot to contribute to the, you know, building of this country and making it great. And uh, you, it was really the Irish and the Chinese who uh, built those railroads. And, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, if you really dug around, you know, the borders of, of the railroad, you would probably find the bones of many, you know, um, Chinese men and probably Irish too, that really died working on those railroads. So um, I'm very proud to say that my lineage, because I'm from this region called Taishan, T-A-I-S-H-A-N. It's a region in Southern uh, Guangdong province of which the old capital used to uh, be called Canton, but now it's called Guangzhou, of course. So I was born in, you know, probably the equivalent of a 16th century uh, Chinese uh, sleepy village, you know, very, very medieval in a way. Um, you know, the chickens would just really strut around, you know, the courtyard next to the uh, temple where I used to play. And uh, the houses were very, very modest. No electricity, you know, we had to draw water from our well, and uh, it was an agrarian type of life. So, uh, but basically the people in Taishan, the Taishan region were the first to send their uh, sons and daughters overseas to America to help build America and make it great. This is incredible. Your, your story, um, I, I know you had some pretty pretty tough times, you know, did you find, do you find inspiration from that, your upbringing that give you the, the drive to become who you wanted to be, especially in the year and in, in this time, right? You, you come here, you become a fashion designer. Um, what drives you, Sue? Uh, I think probably what really drove me because don't forget, you know, I'm one of those people um, whom I would really call myself a, a, a creative intuitive. And what that means is that, you know, the knowledge and the wisdom and of discipline that I really have carried inside myself is not really the type of knowledge that was learned from a university or a greater, a higher institution of uh, learning. Because fashion design, I chose as my modality of, uh, you know, work, of creative work, because I had kids to raise, I had a family to take care of, my mom and dad, my brothers to really take care of, uh, even my husband. So um, I carried a lot of really weight. So I think it was really um, being initially rejected by my father, basically. And that gave me the impetus to really go out in the world and probably be this great overachiever to really prove my worthiness to him. So that really was a lifelong quest that I really had to overcome. And I think just really now at this point in my life, I really feel that I finally have done it, you know, and I don't really need to really prove anything anymore. But it really took a whole my whole lifetime. And also, um, I think uh, I, I went into fashion basically as a sideline because originally I wanted to study art and I wanted to be a painter. Um, so, you know, fortunately, my, my uh, older son, Ezra, uh, got that privilege. Um, I sent him to the finest uh, schools and universities, including Yale School of Painting, where he graduated with his MFA. So he got to really do everything I wanted to do in life. But, you know, um, I, I think I'm really proud of my achievements, and um, I'm still continuing to really create because um, I'm not really doing fashion as much anymore, but I'm all around creative because uh, right now I just really, you know, started a new business um, and it's Sue Wong Designer Signature Homes, uh, which eventually will be a Sue Wong Designer Signature Hotels. Um, and um, I'm going to be making my biopic Red Lotus, as I mentioned. Uh, red means, um, everything uh, passionate about life. Uh, it's the sacred Chinese color because it's the color of the lifeblood. So it's, it's tough to think about it. When you're alive, 
you know, everything is passionate, the lifeblood flows through you, and it's really everything positive about life. Now, the funereal color for the Chinese is white, not black, because white is when the lifeblood has left your body and you turn white, you know? So basically, the Chinese wear white, you know, uh, for the funeral, and the brides always wear red because red is the holy, sacred color of life. You know, you, you really inspire me just hearing you talk. Thank you. Your, your drive. I wish, I wish I can become someone like you. You know, I, I wish a lot of people uh, were as humble as, as you are. I know there's many people out there that reach a, a pinnacle of success and they're still, they, they become a different person. And I feel that you use your, um, you're very, very uh, still inspired by your, your, your Chinese background, your heritage, um, there's, there's so much. The Chinese invented so many things. Well, I, I carry 5,000 years of DNA memory uh, from my culture. I mean, the Chinese really was a very advanced civilization. I agree. Um, the, the, there was a, a dark period during the Cultural Revolution where basically Chairman Mao uh, abolished um, all of the great old teachings from Buddha, from uh, uh, Taoism, which was uh, the wisdom of Lao Tzu, Confucius, Confucianism, and he basically abolished all, um, you know, uh, spiritual worship. When I was the, there still, they took, um, um, I come from a Taoist uh, tradition, so we had a Taoist temple in the front of our village, which was very, very mysterious, and there were all these incredible icons and they, uh, you know, requisitioned the temple uh, as the party headquarters. And, uh, you know, after, after a while, they, they uh, took our cooking utensils away. So you couldn't even really, you know, cook a personal meal anymore. And everybody had to eat from the common mess hall. So at the end of the day, because there was really food scarcity everywhere, um, you know, you were rationing a bowl of rice with some vegetables, no meat. You know, there was really famine um, and hunger everywhere. And as a matter of fact, my little grandmother, you know, who's the first love in my life, um, she kept me alive. You're going to really be grossed out by this, okay? But she kept me alive by chasing rats around the house. And, uh, you know, she cooked them for, pan fried them for me for dinner. And sometimes my mother, who was really assigned to, uh, you know, cutting woods in, in, in the uh, you know, nearby uh, woods, she uh, would trap some field mice and bring three field mice back. And that was really, you know, like a sort of like a delicacy or, or something special for dinner. So it's really hard to fathom, fathom you know, uh, my roots and, and where I came from. But I think this is really what has really kept me in touch with my humble roots. And uh, I th think you mentioned a lot of people they get successful and they really turn to be uh, other human beings. And I think it's because they never really work on themselves. They really never do the spiritual or internal work, uh, the introspective work. So they just really get lost in their image and their external egos. And then they're, they're, you know, they may really have material success, but the wisdom is really lost on them. So, you know, you, you can really be, the most successful person on earth. But if you don't really have wisdom as a compass to live by, you become a lost soul, you know? And I'm gonna tell you, you know, um, I, I've done a lot of, uh, you know, basically, um, you know, uh, dwelled into Jungian psychotherapy for about 16 years. And I lived through uh, metaphors and symbols, which is really what Carl Jung really taught that there are symbols and great metaphors in our lives every day of the week, but most people are not astute enough or aware enough to understand what those mean. But, you know, basically we get signals all the time. And also, you know, the, the uh, Carl Jung basically um, invented, if you, I don't know whether that's really the word, but he basically came up with a whole concept of archetypes, you know, so uh, 
I lived through, uh, I lived my life, you know, like I said, through archetypes and symbols. And so I have three archetypal goddesses, if not more, to follow. Uh, the first one would be Aphrodite. You know, Aphrodite was the uh, goddess of love and beauty. And that's really what I do. And I worship at her temple every single day. And, uh, you know, so she really is my goddess of, you know, love, light, and creativity. You know where, you and, know where uh, Aphrodite was born? Uh, Aphrodite was born in Greece, of course. <laughs> Off the coast of Cyprus. Oh, there you go. There you go. You know, but I think she's a universal symbol. Yes. And, uh, and she, she, I think, really was given a metaphorical birth. But anyway, um, the equivalent of Aphrodite in the Eastern tradition would be Kuan Yin. So I really have the two sides of Kuan Yin. There's, you know, the uh, white Tara, she, as she is called in the Hindu or the Buddhist pantheon, is really the uh, beautiful aspect of uh, Kuan Yin. And of course, she's a, a goddess of love, beauty, and compassion. And then there's the dark Kuan Yin, when basically you have uh, tried compassion and love and everything else, and people don't get it. So then I become the wrathful Kuan Yin. And, you know, my nickname sometimes is Samurai Sue. <laughs> so you do not mess with Samurai Sue, you know, because then I really turn into a badass. You know? <laughs> well, your heritage is incredible. I was speaking with someone and uh, there was a book just published a few years ago that has proof that the Chinese knew about the whole known world. They gave, they gave the Pope at the time or the head of the Catholic Church at the time a map of the known world and somehow... Christopher Columbus actually took the map and came here. So they were here I before. wouldn't doubt it because, you know, they find Chinese uh, artifacts and, and porcelain, you know, that have really been discovered along the coast of Oregon and California and even uh, parts of uh, Mexico, you know. So uh, they were probably, you know, long time uh, ancient navigators. So, you know, and, and I think the ancients were a lot more connected than uh, what people, you know, uh, can imagine. So let me go back to my other archetypal goddesses. You know, I have two more. And so uh, basically uh, the second archetypal goddess, um, you know, that I uh, follow uh, and who's my inspiration would be the goddess of the hunt, which is Artemis. So Ad Artemis is my warrior goddess and she is whom, um, whom propels me out into the world to achieve and to uh, accomplish. So, you know, I think personal achievement and accomplishment is very important to me. For instance, when I, you know, first um, came out uh, to be a fashion designer, I was really impassioned by, by, by fashion, you know, probably because I grew up, you know, the daughter of struggling poor immigrants and I just really saw all the other uh, girls in school wearing these really beautiful Western dresses. And my mother would really stitch me these really um, sort of funny looking Chinese dresses. And I felt very um, conspicuous, I guess. Um, and uh, I stood out in the wrong way. So, uh, but anyway, when I set out, I didn't really say to myself, I'm gonna be the most wealthy or most successful fashion designer I wanted to be the best one. And you know, th th that's what people really have to do if they really want to rise above the fray and rise above medi mediocrity, they really have to shoot for excellence. So I have very, very high standards. You know, sometimes I'm probably a little difficult <laughs> you know, to, on, on the people around me, but I do have really high, high standards of excellence. But then that's what really separates the men from the boys or the girls from, from, from the, you know, goddesses or whatever you want to call that. So uh, my last goddess that I pay homage to every single day in the way I live my life, in the way I interact with people, in the way uh, that I perceive things is the perception and then what you do with your life, how you walk in the world, and how you talk in the world, and how you 
walk your talk in the world. So that uh, to me is really important. And that is the goddess Athena. So you're, you're, you're Greek or, you know, a Cypriot. So it's very, very similar. So you come from very ancient traditions as well as I do. Um, so these are my goddesses of the uh, Western pantheon. And I was, uh, you know, many years ago, not many years, probably seven or eight years ago, I actually went to uh, Greece and I went to Athens and I went to the, the Acropolis, which is a very, very magical vortex, by the way. I mean, just by uh, virtue of the fact that the entire Acropolis is built of crystals. Can you imagine what a PowerPoint, you know, the Acropolis is? And on top of the Acropolis sits the temple of Athena, you know, the, the uh, Parthenon. So um, she is my goddess of the wisdom sphere because Diana is all about wisdom and balance and impartiality. So you can be the greatest artist on the planet you can be the most successful businessman or businesswoman and uh, you know, a great achiever, but if you do not have wisdom to really navigate your life with, you have nothing. So you know, I think wisdom is very, very important and wisdom is a totally different thing from knowledge. You know, knowledge is something that you gain from the universities, which by the way, I didn't even go to a university. Um, like I said, I'm an intuitive, you know, in many different ways, and that's why I can really excel in many different areas. I mean, most people know me as a fashion designer, but in fact, like I said, that's only one aspect of me. I did that, you know, uh, for many decades because I had, you know, a family. To, to feed and kids to take care of. But in fact, I'm really very skilled at many other modalities. If I you know, hadn't been a fashion designer in life, I would have been an interior designer. So I have designed homes, interiors, uh, gardens, you know, patios, furniture. Uh, I write as well. If you go on my Facebook, you can read some of my wisdom writings. And, uh, you know, um, I, I can arrange flowers. I can, you know, I'm, I'm really a good, great uh, hostess. And I basically uh, coordinate parties together. I do experiential fashion shows. I mean, I do everything that is really visual. There, there's nothing that I can't do that is really visual. You know, I can't make music, but I'm a great lover of music, for instance. So anyway, th that's my... Um, archetypal goddesses of the Greek pantheon. And, and I think like, you're right. You want to be the best in everything. And that's the way everyone should look at things, right? You should, yes. you, you should, you know, I want to be the best radio host in the world. I want to be the best fashion designer, but you can say that if you don't walk the walk or and talk the talk, right? Yeah. You don't actually, make it there. You don't have the aspiration. You got to have the drive behind it to make it happen. And you, you've done so much and achieved a, a lot of things. And your new project that I've been reading about is the Cedars. Um, is, that well, one, actually, is that one house among others? Or? Well, I have three homes, you know, uh, in my paradigm, the three houses that I have or that I live in. I, I actually have, have more homes than that, but I actually inhabit three homes. Uh, the Cedars is my uh, Hollywood grand, uh, uh, grand dame, I would say. You know, she was like the most elaborate and the most uh, lavish house of her day when she was conceived in the 1920s. And I'll, you know, give you a little bit of, about its uh, illustrious history in a, in a minute. But I have um, the Cedars, which represents to me, she, she's like a beautiful uh a uh, grand dame or, or an elegant woman. So she represents mind, I mean, I'm sorry, body. So my three homes represent body, mind, and spirit. So the cedars is the corporeal feminine body. Then I have a whole 180 degree turn of who I really am that people don't know about that much. And that I basically am also not only a sentimental uh, romantic, which what the Cedars is the ultimate, you know, romantic home of the 1920s and 1930s, 
just because it's so iconic and so many fabulous people have lived here. So then I have, uh, I've been collecting art for, you know, about, you know, almost four decades. So um, I really have amassed a really great modern art collection from um, mostly my best friends, although I have an Andy Warhol Mao in my collection as well. Um, and they're all the most fabulous, fabulous talent. And I just really felt that it was really uh, appropriate to collect and to su support my contemporaries who are also my best friends. So I have about 200 pieces of art in my contemporary art collection, which I scatter around, you know, my design studios, my three homes, et cetera. And uh, so that house is in Malibu is completely modernistic. I have 180 degree in your face, white water, white sand view. It's spectacular. And uh, so that's where I showcase my uh, modern art collection. And it's got high ceilings, all white walls, and I designed the most amazing, beautiful cactus garden all around on, you know, like over an acre. And so that is the sphere of the mental, as far as I'm concerned, because modern art to me is very conceptual. It's really like, you know, uh, jazz, you know, it's like freeform jazz, let's say, you know. So then uh, the last home that I really in inhabit, and I probably don't, don't go there enough, just because I'm so busy creatively in the world, is my uh, spiritual sanctuary in uh, Maui, on the island of Maui, tucked away on the east side of Maui, in a beautiful, pristine rainforest. I actually have three properties there, including a 35 oceanfront um, sacred piece of land that I got from the Luau warriors. It actually belonged to um, Cordelia Mellon May, who uh, was a member of the Mellon, the illustrious Mellon family. And upon her death, she bequeathed it to the um, Nature Conservancy, who decided to put it up for sale. So uh, the community of Kipahulu is a green, you know, ecologically conscious, you know, uh, they're the, you know, nature uh, conservation. I myself am a nature con uh, conservatist, you know. I basically donated a million dollars to the Nature Conservancy and also a million dollars to my uh, community of Kipahulu, which is only about 200 people, by the way. But it's the most pristine and gorgeous, well preserved rainforest. And I don't know whether you've ever been on the island of Maui, but there's a, this drive called the Hana Highway. And that is a world famous highway that is one of the most scenic roads in all of the world. I mean, I would say it rivals the Amalfi Drive, but it's, it's a different type of feeling, of course. But you're, you know, sort of like a careening over perilous cliffs that plunge down about 200 feet below with the waves crashing. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's very, very, um, perilous to get there but I mean what a gorgeous place I mean it truly is heaven on earth and as a matter of fact the famous aviator uh, Charles Lindbergh is buried there uh, at Palapala Mau Mau Church and uh, he and his best friend uh, Sam Pryor who basically you know discovered the seven sacred pools of Kipahulu where the Ali'i class the Ali'i class was the uh, ancient Hawaiian royalty. So there's a series of seven pools cascading all the way down from the crater, which is the, the crater of Haleakala. Haleakala means the house of the sun. So, you know, uh, and these uh, pools are brackish water. And so in the ancient times, only the ali'i, the royal class, was able to really uh, bathe in these sacred pools so uh, so so i i have all these different aspects of me and everyone is really equally me they're just different aspects of who i am you know it's you know you have to have a really fine balance of body mind and spirit to be a fully realized dimensional human being you can't just really dwell in one realm and not the others
your family and your friends must be so inspired by your, your mentality. You, you know, I, I'm listening to you. I can't wait, can't wait to see this biopic, this Red Lotus biopic. Why, why, why um, did you decide to go with a biopic then writing an, an actual book for people to well, read? Well, I'm doing both, actually. Okay. You know, I, I've started my autobiography. And since, you know, like, uh, I, I feel that I have to um, make this film. I feel compelled to write my autobiography because I've had such an incredible story to tell that I really think that my story can really help other people have belief in themselves. Because, you know, I think, you know, what is really lacking in many, many people that they really, you know, have a struggle with. And maybe this is really the reason for all the, you know, uh, pestilence and the wars and the ego battles between nations and everything. There's a lack of self-love and a lack of self-belief in most people. And I came from less than nothing circumstances. You know, I basically grew up in the ghetto in South Central LA until I was about 12 years old. And, um, so I grew up in a uh, mixed ethnic uh, ghetto with, you know, Asians and blacks and some whites, very few whites left anymore. Uh, but uh, Hispanics, you know, uh, we had a mixed neighborhood. And so we were, you know, um, not restricted by color. I mean, you know, there's so much uh, racial um, tension right now in America. But, you know, we have to really understand that we are all this from the same tribe. We are from the same one human family. And, uh, you know, I just really want to really, you know, tell my story, you know, to inspire other people to really have confidence and not make yourself into the victim because victims ain't got no power, you know? As long as you remain, remain a victim, you can't really free yourself, you know, from, uh, you get stuck, you get stuck in that victimhood and you can't really progress. So if I made it, you know, coming from eating rats, growing up in the ghetto, you know, and not even knowing a word of English, I was a stranger in a strange land when I came to America. I mean, in my child's mind, you know, from Kim Shan, which is Gold Mountain, I thought the streets of America was actually going to be paved with gold. And I thought that there were going to be um, sparkling gems just really, you know, um, hanging from the trees. You know? So that, that was really my, my uh, illusion of America. But anyway, I just really, you know, one has to really have a vision of what they really want in life. And when you have that vision, you have to really hold that vision and really, you know, give it energy. You have to have enough confidence to give your dreams and your visions power by believing in it. And, you know, even Einstein said, everything in the universe is all about energy. We are energy, you know, uh, everything is connected. So you have to really, you know, tap into that power of self-belief to manifest your dreams and uh, you know one of my other favorite teachers besides Carl Jung they're really to me uh, both of the most important thinkers um, and writers and teachers of the uh, 20th century Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell you know so Joseph Campbell basically taught well you have to follow your bliss so you know it goes back to what I said previously, you know, about really manifesting your dreams by really giving it energy and really wanting to be um, excellent and having that passion and that fire that really drives you forward. And that's really has driven me forward because I basically followed my bliss. I followed my bliss to really do something that lights up my soul you know and when you do that and you have the passion and that passion is your bliss you can't really help but be successful and people don't realize that 
the reason why people, you know, like give up in their dreams is, is because they don't really stay with it. You know, you have to stay with it. You know, I think another teacher, George Gurdjieff, he taught the three P's, which are basically uh, patience, persistence, and perseverance. So you got to have all of that and the drive. You got to stay with the program. You don't stay with the program, your dreams and your visions will disperse. They will lose force and they will lose momentum. So I'm trying to really, you know, tell you and your audience how basically I manifested my dreams. And believe me, I've had my share of Shakespearean, or in your case, I'll say Greek tragedies, you know, in my life. Because to me, the Greeks really had it figured out many, many thousands of years ago, you know, the whole human condition. So hence you have the Greek tragedy and the Greek comedy, you know? So, and that is what we human beings are all about. You know, it's tragic and it's comedic at the same time. But you know, the, 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 the Greeks were the ones that basically figured out the archetypes and people like Shakespeare picked it up in his time. And you know, like, so you hear about the Shakespearean tragedy where he talks about all this human drama of lust and greed and power mongering and betrayal and everything. Well, I've had more than probably 10 lifetime share of that stuff in my lifetime, you know? But you have to roll with the punches because to me, everything is a test. Everything is a test from higher powers, you know, beyond us, you know, and, and we are here with four great purposes. You know, we have to pay back the karmic debt. We have to really be here for learning. We have to really have a purpose and have a sense of contribution, you know, and uh, we, we have to really do all of these things because that's what we're, that's what we came here for. So you got to really find your purpose in life, you know, and you have to really be driven by passion and commitment to that purpose. And that's what really, you know, makes us great. Otherwise, you're going to just really be mediocre. You're just going to be mediocre and go with a sort of sheeple, you know, which a lot of people just, it's safer to be a sheeple, but it really takes risk to be excellent at what you do. I, I've always, I've always believed that your, your, your energy should be in, in sync with your soul. Absolutely. If you stay true to your soul and you stay true to what your inner voices tell you to follow, you can't ever go wrong. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, your, your, your soul, your soul's wishes have to have to be dark or evil, but you know, what really is, basically another way of following your bliss. Following your bliss is basically being true to your soul, you know, being true to, um, you know, what really enlivens you. You gotta really do what's, what enlivens you, what excites you, what gives you soul and passion. You know, that's basically how I live my life. Sue, this was awesome. And I really feel that a lot of people could really look if they're looking for some inspiration uh, some words of wisdom on a on a nice night like this they can listen to the show or listen to you talk it, it's it's i i still want to hear more um i know we we ran out of a bit of a time flying here but um i you want can to always have me back <laughs> oh i would love to i would and, and love I'll tell to. you i'll tell you part two i'll tell you what really happened to me because it's been you know i considered life to be a sort of a there was a, a beatles album it was called, um, you know, Magical Mystery Tour. And that's what life is all about. You don't know what the gods really, you know, what loops they're going to throw you. So everything to me is a test to see how you deal with stuff, even if it's really ugly or adverse or tragedy or betrayal or failure. You know, you just really have to really deal with it the best way and not really become a victim, not really decry your fate. You know, because everything to us are given as lessons of spirit. And it's really important that you really pass the grade, pass the test, because that's what it's all about in life. 
I also have a bit of a metaphor that me and my sister were both in the, in the media field. And we always say, be one with your reality. Be one yes. with, with who you are. I mean, you know, I, I know your, your father heard you in another podcast talk about how your father wanted you to become an accountant. Well, our, our parents wanted us to become super successful in, in finance and business and whatever. Uh, but I've always wanted to be on the radio. I've always wanted to talk in the mic. I wanted to be in front of the camera since I was five years old. Well, there you go. You're following your bliss, you know, yeah. and I think a, a little adjunct to that is, you know, in, in addition to really uh, following your bliss, you have to really be in the moment because that's what really basically, uh, you know, great teachers like Buddha and even Ram Das, he, he wrote a book called Be Here, Be Now, which means that you really have to be living in the present. You know, don't dwell in the past. Past already happened. The future is not here yet. You are living in the here and in the now and make the most of it. Make it really beautiful. Make it worthwhile. You know, make it your bliss. And you're the only one who can make your future happen. So if you Absolutely. envision it, it'll happen. You got to just work towards it and, and ask the universe, to use your energy, energy to ask the universe to gravitate that towards you. But you have to actually want it, right? You got to pull it towards you like a magnet. It's like a magnet. You know, everything in the universe is really about energy and your thoughts really, you know, uh, your predominant thoughts is what really manifests your, your future, your life. You know, there's uh, three key words, and they are called think, act, and become. You uh, become what you think. And, you know, the thought energy manifests, you know, and you become the reality that you dream up. You know, so what you think what, how you speak or what you speak and how you feel really will determine your destiny. So it's called thinking and destiny. So have positive vibrations, have positive thoughts only, and you will draw positivity towards you. You really have negative thoughts of hate and destruction and doubt and fear. You will draw that to you as well. So it's very important to really think proper thoughts because that will become your destiny. Inspirational words coming from fashion icon, Su Wong. Thank you so much. And finally, You're welcome, George. the question I ask every celebrity that comes on my show, it's about yes. coffee. Do you drink coffee, Sue? I do drink coffee. You know, I drink a French coffee and, uh, you know, uh, I have it every morning, just about. Um, I love coffee. I can't drink really too much of it because I already have so much natural energy that, you know, the caffeine just kind of pushes me over the edge. <laughs> well, at least I know what to buy you when I come see you in uh, California one day. I'd, I'd love to meet you in person. Um, well, you're welcome anytime to come and visit the Cedars. And we forgot to talk about the Cedars. My God. Oh, what let's, an talk incredible about it. let's talk about it right now. Okay. Sure. Well, the Cedars is, a, is probably the most iconic Hollywood glamorous palace. It really is a palace. And beyond a palace, it's really a museum. And as a matter of fact, it will be a future museum because I'm actively, you know, forming the Su Wong Legacy Foundation. And it will be my contribution and my uh, bequeathing uh, of the cedars to the world for future generations to enjoy. I'm not going anywhere yet, folks. This is still my home. <laughs> but in the future, that's what I would like to see, to really see uh, the cedars transform into a living museum because that's what it is. So I'll just tell you uh, very briefly about its history and I'll tell you some of the most illustrious names that really have lived, lived here. So she was really uh, the inspiration and the brainchild um, uh, of a uh, French artist who came from Paris by the name of Maurice Tunier. And he was a filmmaker, worked for MGM Studios. And he was the one who made the black and white silent version of Last of the Mohicans, by the way, um, including Henrik Ibsen's The Doll's House. And so he, this whole thing was his creative vision. Originally it was on uh, 15 acres of the Hollywood Hills with 
um, you know, fountains, and there was a lake at the bottom of the hill, gorgeous, you know, uh, formal gardens and uh, fountains cascading all the way down the terrace gardens. Anyway, um, sadly, a lot of the land has been sold off, but I probably still have about three quarters of an acre here because I have a three house compound. So anyway, she's also known as the Norma Talmadge estate, and Norma Talmadge was the preeminent I would say silent movie star of her era. And she was married to uh, Joseph Schenck. And Joe Schenck basically was the one who founded 20th Century Fox Studios. So they lived here and they would entertain their best friends, which, which was uh, Charlie Chaplin, Sir Douglas uh, Fairbanks, and uh, Mary Pickford, his wife, uh, over here. And eventually they, the five of them formed United Artists uh, Pictures together. You know, um, I think, you know, some of us uh, old timers still remember United, UA, United Artists Studios. So anyway, that was, uh, the, uh, that's why sometimes it's nicknamed as the Norma Talmadge estate. And uh, so uh, Norma Talmadge was the inspiration for the character of Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard. Did you ever see that movie by Billy Wilder? You know, it's, it's a classic. You know, that's, that's the line where uh, she uttered, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up now. Oh, I remember that. Okay, yeah. It was a Gloria Swanson's comeback with the very hunky uh, William Holden, made in 1949, I believe. And uh, it, it's, it's a priceless, you know, a piece of uh, cinema. Anyway, that in, uh, part was really filmed at the Cedars. So uh, after uh, Joseph Shank and Norma Talmadge lived here, Howard Hughes lived here. So this was his uh, address in the early 30s. After that, um, I would say Errol Flynn lived here. After Errol Flynn, it was Bella Lugosi who lived here. And because Bella Lugosi lived here, Johnny Depp lived here decades later because he was vibing in on, uh, you know, Bella Lugosi, because uh, uh, Johnny Depp played Ed Wood, which was really, he was a B um, movie director, um, and it was a Tim Burton film. And then Martin Landau gave a scathing and wonderful performance uh, as Bella Lugosi. And as a matter of fact, this is really how crazy it is. I dressed, you know, um, Martin Landau's wife, you know, when he won the Oscar <laughs> to, to, to go to the, the, the Oscars that year. And then um, I was, you know, friends with Marilyn Manson, whose best friend is Johnny Depp. So, you know, it, it's, it's really like a, a really sort of um, circle that kind of really is all interconnected. And then after that, um, I believe in the 60s, it became this iconic rock palace. So, the only one of that group that I met shortly before he passed was uh, Arthur Lee and the band called Love. You know, so they were really big in the 60s, early 70s, and they still have a cult following in Europe because I would really come out, you know, and one day I came out into the street and there were these two rockers just really pointing at my house and they happened to have been German. And they said, wow, is this, you know, like Arthur Lee's house? <laughs> I said, yeah, he lived here at one time. Anyway, Arthur Lee brought in his best friend, Jimi Hendrix. So Jimi Hendrix lived here. And I designed a Moroccan room, um, you know, in an exotic manner to honor um, Jimmy's, you know, to, Arthur, uh, to, to uh, honor uh, Jimi Hendrix and my own bohemian past. So then uh, there was Bob Dylan who lived here. Uh, there was Van Morrison who lived here. There was uh, Jim Morrison who lived here. There was uh, John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas and the Rolling Stones lived here with Brian Jones. I mean, the list goes on. And then in 1968, they made the iconic movie Easy Rider here. So Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda were here. So uh, if you ever look at the film again, all the, the scenes, the New Orleans scenes, you know, they were filmed right at my foyer, you know, the huge ballroom with the golden colonnade, uh, as well as my library. 
So, you know, uh, that, that was, you know, um, filmed here. So it's a legendary house. And, you know, it is a vortex and it, it is haunted. <laughs> I, I always tell people I live with a lot of famous ghosts. Well, we should get the, into that some other time. Maybe we can uh, do a bit of a paranormal, uh, what's called the, the, the conquest that Jimmy and uh, Jim Russ, uh, Ron Russell do. They went on this uh, parano paranormal uh, ghost hunt. That's what it was. Well, um, well, I already did that. And, you know, Jimmy came through uh, uh, to one of the um, paranormal uh, investigators. And he said that, you know, there's a song that he, uh, that, that he wrote and he hid it in one of the golden columns. They're sort of like ionic, uh, you know, classical uh, Grecian uh, columns, but he didn't, he wouldn't tell us which one. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's a lot of spirit. I mean, you know, the energy is so intense because you walk in and you know exactly that there are other, you know, beings and entities, you know, uh, living there because my, Qigong master, Master Bruce Sun walked in and every hair in his arms stood straight up and he just opened his arms and he said, hello, everyone. <laughs> that, that's not creepy at all. <laughs> oh, man. No, to, to me, it's not creepy because, you know, I really have formed a friendship or a friendly relationship with the spirits. I think they respect me. They respect the fact that I basically... Uh, took time and uh, energy, not to mention resources, to really restore the house way beyond her formal glory. And she is just really the most beautiful um, icon, you know, in, in the world. I think she's really an extraordinary home. And uh, one of these days when you have me on again, we'll flash some photos uh, for your audience. Definitely. They can check you out at suwong.com. That's your website. Yes. Also, if you're in the United States or you're a Canadian, one day you go across the border, you can check out her, her clothing line, which is pretty cool, at uh, Macy's, Nordstrom, and many other retailers as well. Sue Even Wong. Marcus Dexford Avenue, Bloomingdale's. Yes, and also, uh, you know, uh, your, your uh, listeners can, uh, your, your audience can also find me on uh, Facebook under Sue Wong Fashion, as well as uh, Instagram. So... Um, and I do a very colorful Facebook because I call it the Sue Wong Daily. It's almost like a magazine. And I post it about beauty, about fashion, about art, about architecture, about uh, literature, about philosophy, spirituality, everything that really interests me. That's incredible. Thank you so much, Sue. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me, George. <laughs>